So from time to time, I like to torture myself. And I'll go online and I'll order stuff that requires assembly. Isn't that fun? Like, and I'm actually, I'm actually pretty handy. Just ask me, I'll tell you. Um, though there's some of you I know that don't think that I am. This week I'm at a buddy's house and I, I'm borrowing a power, don't, I'm borrowing a power drill. I'm borrowing a drill and he has like a two by four and I'm like, hey, I need to use that too. I'm doing all these projects at my house. So I grab the drill, I grab a two by four and his wife walks out. She goes, oh, are you using those for like sermon illustrations? I'm like, no, I'm actually using these to do things. I mean, she's not, anyway. So I, we go online, this is years ago and I order a shelving unit and I thought, how hard can it be? There are sides, there's a top, there's a bottom, there's some shelves, should come in like eight pieces. Well, it shows up in about 87 pieces. And I thought to myself, this is awesome. So I lay everything out on the floor and I gauge everything. And then I, and then I like grab the instructions and I start at step one. I'm just kidding. I didn't look at the instructions. Uh, I just start getting after it. So I start building and putting this thing together. I think it says it should take a couple hours. Took me most of, most of the day. But anyway, so I, at the end of the day, it's done. And I, and I remember I'm getting ready to call the family down and get the cameras rolling and celebrate what, what God has put together here. And, it, and I, tr I flip it around and put it right side up and I look at it. And I'm like, this is awesome. And then I look at it and I'm like, wait a minute. The, the shelving is all messed the, the, the shelving is like, like messed up. It's wrong. Because it was all, un every shelf was unfinished. And I'm like, they sent us a faulty product. And I was just upset. And then I realized... Well, they didn't send us a faulty product. I had inserted all the shelves upside down. And I remember I, in that moment, there was such, I mean, there was this rage. I mean, you talk about rage against the machine. I was like ready to go ballistic. Like I was so upset. And I'm like, I, I have to start over. Because it, what you could, you're thinking, oh, you just slide the shelves out. No, 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 you couldn't do that. The way it was constructed, you have to disassemble everything. Okay, say everything. Yeah, everything. Everything and start over. And I remember thinking to myself, uh, Jody, get the sledgehammer. It's, I mean, thank God we didn't own a sledgehammer, but it would have been over. I was so, oh, by the way, you know where that shelving unit is today? Neither do I. And that makes me even more mad. We should have that in our home. That was work. We should be passing that down from generation to generation. I'm just saying. So starting over is not fun. That was painful. But this, this series, the new normal that we've been in, if we look at it from a different angle, it's really about starting over. It's really about starting fresh. It's really seizing an opportunity. But what I didn't see coming in this series was like in the middle of this week, what I didn't see coming is starting over in a message midweek, okay? That's the last thing a pastor wants to do, if I can tell you. Like Wednesday, I had my outline all figured out. I knew where I was going. I was actually going to piggyback on last week's message uh, called SOAP when we looked at how we could really not just read the Word of God, but, but we taught each other how to really um, apply it to our lives. And oh, by the way, if you haven't seen that message, it's been a game changer. I've been receiving feedback from people and input about how the Word of God, they're getting in and it's changing their life. I mean, it's crazy. I'm thinking about buying a Bible. I don't know. I just, I'm just kidding. I, I have a Bible. So it's been changing lives. But, but So I have a, a message kind of on top of that for this week. And Wednesday, I see the video, right? And you, you already know what I'm talking about probably. And if you don't, well, you do. I mean, if you don't, if you live on planet Earth, you have either saw or heard about the George Floyd video where, um, you know, the cop um, was on top and, and they just kind of sat there on him and kneeled on his neck and he ultimately ended up dying. Something, here's the thing about the media and about social media and the news today. So much comes at us that we can become desensitized. It's like, oh, it's another tragedy. Oh, it's another death. Oh, it's another whatever. And so, and you see those things all the time and things happen every day. But something about this video, there was something about it. Like I just watched and it, and it was different for me. I don't know. I, I just watched it and, and, and to see the people pleading, you know, for the officer to get off of his neck and to hear him pleading saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Please, I can't breathe. And he's begging them to get off him and he can't go anywhere. Even if they do, he's restrained, he's handcuffed. He can't do anything. But, the, but to see the officers so, I don't know, almost like, just like, like they're not hearing anything. They're not seeing anything. There's, there was something so, it hit me in such a weird way. And I knew, I knew, I'm telling you, the last thing I want to do is start over in the message because I put, I put a lot of prayer and a lot of work. I want to bring you the word of God, the best of my ability. And I don't want, I don't want to. And then God brings me to scripture. 
James 2.17. Remember, it is a sin to know what you ought to do and not do it. And I'm like, really, God, you're going to throw scripture at me? Well, he did. He threw it right at me. And it hit me right between the eyes. I didn't want to start over, but I knew I had no choice. I had to. Because I know something. I know something about Meadows Church. I can't speak for anybody else, but I can tell you that we will be a church. We have to be a church that will speak into injustice. We have to be a church that will speak into inequality. We've got to do it. But understand, I don't want to be a church that will just speak into it. I want to be a church that will actually do something. This is huge for me. Like, I get the privilege of leading leaders. I get the privilege of leading some of the greatest leaders in the world, I believe. And something I hope that they know about me and about us is that don't just bring me a problem, right? Don't just point out a problem to me. If you're going to point out a problem, bring a solution. Bring an idea, right? Don't just point out an issue. Bring ideas that will help eradicate the issue, okay? Anybody can point out a problem. Go on social media, right? Go on there for about 2.1 seconds. You will see hundreds of people pointing out the problem, okay? I'm not saying that's all bad, but if that's where it stops, that's bad. I get there, there is a problem, but, but here, I wrote it down. Anyone can point out a problem, but you know what a leader does? A leader does something about it, yeah. right. okay? A leader does something about it, and we have to do something about this. Oh my gosh, I've had probably Eight to ten titles for this message go out through my head throughout this week. I settled on two. I put them together because it works for me. I hope it works for you. The title of today's message is, I Can't Breathe. It starts with me, okay? So I need someone to type in the comments, I can't breathe. And then I need to type, it starts with me, okay? I need you to turn to somebody and say, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Now, now tell your other neighbor, it starts with me. It starts with me. It's got to start with me. It has to start with me. You know what? I'm going to pray for us really quick. I just think for this message, boy, God, I need you all over this. Father, I thank you so much for the opportunity to bring a word that I believe that you have so much to say about. God, help us unpack this in a way that is, that, that, that is a total revelation to us, that you would hit us with your, with your truth in such a way that uh, we can't deny what you are calling us to not only know, but what you are calling us to do. God, soften our hearts and our minds, every one of us, Everyone that this is going to, on the other side of uh, their computers and their phones and wherever they're at, God, we need your spirit. Send it and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name I pray and we all say, amen. amen. Where do we start? There's really three parts to what I'm going, going over today. We have to look at reality, okay? If, if you don't know reality, like if you don't acknowledge reality, we can never get to a solution. We can't. So we have to look at reality and then we're going to look at truth and then we're going to look at practicality, what we do. So here's the reality. I, I just did some quick research. We can't change what we don't acknowledge. We have to acknowledge some things. Uh, a study from last year said, the majority of Americans say race relations in the United States are bad. Most people think that. And a seven out of 10 of those say they're getting not better, but they're getting worse. Okay, that's what a study said. I did, found some other research from a few, few years ago. It said this, racism definitely persists in America. A few stats. People with black sounding names had to send out 50% more job applications than people with white sounding names in order to even get a call back. Okay. A black man is three times more likely to be searched at a traffic stop and six times more likely to go to jail than a white man. That's what the stats say. Blacks serve up to 20% more time in prison than white people for the same crime. I'll give you one more. I could, I could spend the entire time giving you stats. Don't have that kind of time? I'll give you a few. Blacks are 38% more likely to be sentenced to death than white people for the same crime. These are, these are, this is, these are facts. Now, I didn't want to just stop there. Um, I, 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 I wanted to hear from somebody that, are, that currently is in those shoes. Like, I don't know if you know this about me, but I'm, I'm not black. Okay, is that a shocker? I don't think it probably is. I'm white. So I will never be able to fully understand, never, because I'm not walking in those shoes. So I reached out this week to some people in our church that are black, and I said, hey, and I really set them up for a tough question because I I said, if you could could say one thing about this, one thing that you want people to know, what would it be? You know what I found out really quickly? It's almost impossible to say just one thing. And and, And after the responses I got, This conversation is going to continue way beyond this message. You need to know that. We need to sit down. We need to talk. But I'll give you a snippet because that's all we got time for. But uh, one person said this, I have so much to say, 
But one thing I would say is this, being raised black in America at a young age, we're, you're told from family, from peers, and from media that America hates you. Okay? I would say American racism and corruption towards blacks is not a past event, but it's very relevant today in many America commu American communities. We cannot turn an eye to the brutality that is happening. It is black lives that are being stolen, and with it, a common headline on the news is, is e and because it's a common headline on the news, it's easy to become numb and find ways to make excuses, but we can't make excuses for the racism and abuse of power. It needs to stop. We can't get burned out about this or turn away. No matter the color of our, your skin or my skin, we are humans. We must fight, have courage, and, and love for the black men and women. They can't be forgotten. That was just one. Here's another one from somebody else. One of the words that comes to mind for the majority of African Americans, I can't speak for other races, but it's scared. Imagine if you are constantly being in a state of mind where there's instant doubt about you because of the color of your skin, despite education, strong morals, and gainful employment. Being told you're less than because 400 years ago, ignorant people deemed it so. Personally, I have to constantly look over my shoulder at every turn, at work, at the store, at restaurants, worried about jogging in my neighborhood, receiving the same fair treatment as others receive. I've been stopped multiple times for no reason. On one occasion, the officer asked me if the car I was driving was mine. He never asked for my papers. He didn't ask why. I didn't even tell me why I was being stopped. I've had to work twice as hard to get a promotion at my work uh, that was easily handed to my white counterparts. My brother, my own brother, was once slammed against the wall because the suspect they were looking for was black. I mean, he was black. No questions asked. Picture a world where you can't be sure of how your children are going to be treated. What would Jesus say today? How would he look at us today? All in all, I personally, I've been blessed to deal with this through prayer and education and enlightenment to allow it not to affect me as much. But for those less fortunate than me, disenfranchised, never given a chance at anything in life, not educated, brought up with less than, and being fed an ideology of hate, hating society, hating cops, hating other races, the events of last week only reinforced the frustration, resentment, bitterness, hopelessness, and violence that have been ingrained for a while. Now, I'm not naive. I don't want to paint a picture that uh, there isn't you know, like black on black injustice within its own community, daily shootings in black neighborhoods, prejudice against blacks themselves, lack of support for one another. It's all wrong, but some of it does stem from disenfranchisement, opportunity, lack of education, ignorance, and a few other factors that I'm mentioning. So the real question, how do we solve this? these inequality problems, well, that's the million dollar question that I've wrestled with for years. As a nation, we need to heal with God's infinite love. He needs to be reintroduced back into the country because the direction the country is going, it, it does not look good. There's a lack of God in the world, the systems and governments. There's a spiritual battle going on and part of it has led to division and hate in our society. Wow, I mean, like I just said, this conversation has to continue. But I want to give you a snippet of reality. And the reality is this, racism is real. Mm -hmm. If you believe that, type it in comments right now. We have to own it. Mm -hmm. You and I have to own it, whatever color you are. We have to admit that there is a problem, okay? Type in comments, racism is real. Turn to a neighbor and tell them that. Racism is real. Racism, racism is real. <laughs> it's real. So we've established what's real. And if you're thinking for a moment that it doesn't impact you because of where you live or how you think, you've been deceived or you are just in denial because it impacts all of us. It impacts every one of us. So if that's a reality, and it is, what is truth? I asked God, I said, God, where do I start with the truth? Because there's a lot of it. And God's like, how about you show them a picture of what it's supposed to be? And I'm like, well, God, sin kind of messed up what it's supposed to be. He said, we'll start before sin. Well, sin happened in Genesis 3. So what if we started in Genesis 1? What it was supposed to be. Let's look at that. Genesis 1, verse 26 and 27. Say the beginning. beginning. This is the beginning. This was the picture before we were corrupted the way that we're corrupted today. Then God said, Let us make human beings in our image 
Okay, our? Yeah, it's the Trinity. God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are together creating. And he says, let them make them in our image to be like us. They will reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, and all the wild animals on the earth. And the small animals that scurry on the ground. God continues. So God created human beings in his own image. I love it. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. This is truth. I'll give you a truth out of that. All humans, say all humans. All humans, all humans are made in God's image. Right. Everyone. Everyone. And, and you might think, well, that's elementary. No, it is not. No, it is not. Because if we understood that truth, it would change the way that we live and the way that we love. All humans are made in God's image. No human being is more or less a human than any other. Okay? We all have the same parents. Adam and Eve. Every one of us have the same parents. So what race is Adam and Eve? Right? We always want to know that. I'll answer that. I'm going to answer that today. I've researched it. I've, I've, done, I've done my fact checking. Okay? You ready for this? Time to cause some controversy. What race was Adam and Eve? The human race. That's what race they were. They were the human race. No, 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 pastor. What I meant is what color, what color was the skin of Adam and Eve? And as soon as we ask that question, we realize the problem, don't we? Mm -hmm. Don't we realize at that point what we're really asking? Well, I, they were like me. They looked like me. No, 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 no. I think they looked like me. No, I think they looked like, here's the answer. They look like us. Yeah. That's who they look like. They look like us. See, the Bible, if you want to get technical, Oh, so they look like us. So you're saying we should be just colorblind, right? Oh, we don't see color. We just see the people. That's, a, that's not what I'm saying at all. You should see color, okay? Color's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. God created color. God created the diversity. God created the ethnicity that we get to see in our world today. God created it. Yes, you should see it. It's a beautiful thing. That's why he did it. But when you, when you, if you want to trace back to what color was Adam and Eve, we don't know. We don't know because the Bible doesn't really say what color they were. Heck, as far as I know, they might have woke up a different color every day. I don't, wouldn't, that be, wouldn't that be a trip? It's Black Monday. It's White Tuesday, Brown Wednesday. Thursday, you wake up, look in the mirror, and you're a Smurf. Do, 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 do. Anyway, so um, it, well, every day, a different color. I don't know. Bible doesn't say. Mm. You know what else? God's Word doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us the color they were, or why it doesn't tell us that. It doesn't tell us what color Adam and Eve were. Why? Because I wrote it down this way. God doesn't equate the human race with a particular skin tone. That's right. I'll say it again. God doesn't equate the human race with a particular or certain skin tone. Whatever color they were, they contained DNA designed by God that would eventually develop into a multicolored family across a multicultural world. This is God's design. So God's word is showing this regardless of the color of our skin. We all have the same parents, Adam and Eve, and we all are part of the same human race. This is truth. And by the way, I'll just add to that, we are all in the same desperate need of the same grace and the same love and the same mercy from the same God who loves us all the exact same way. This is God's truth. This is what he wants you to know, that we are the same in that race, that we are created equal. That's the second point. If the first one is that we're made in God's image, the second one is we are all equally loved by God. Yep. I'll say it again. We are all equally loved by God. Someone, I, I need you to put that in the comments right now. We are equally loved by God. For God so loved the world. The world. Yep. Would you type world in comments? Find the world emoji, put it in comments. We are, it, for God so loved the Caucasians. Yeah, he did. For God so loved the Puerto Ricans. Yep, he did. For God so loved African Americans. Yep, and I could go down the list and I'll say yes to everyone. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. Equally. Do you know what racism is? Racism, racism is the opposite of equality. Okay? By definition, racism, one ethnic group believing they are superior over another. Just because of their ethnicity. That's racism. That is the opposite of equality. 
That is the opposite of God's plan before sin would enter the world. Do you see the truth of what God is saying? But, but, but wait a minute. If, if God says everybody is equally loved, what about like the Israelites? Man, I read the Old Testament and it's God's chosen people and God set them apart and God's given them the promised land. Listen to me. God loved the Israelites as much as the non-Israelites or the Gentile people. He loved them all the same. He had set the Israelites apart to set an example of what his love looks like to show a moral code of what it looks like to love God and live like God. They were supposed to be an example of what it looks like to be God's people. He didn't do it because he loved them more. He did it because he loved them all the same. But he needed to show others what it looked like. But the Israelites would jack it all up. They messed it all up and they couldn't get it right. But he loved them all the same. And because they couldn't get it right and because sin is so prevalent and was so prevalent, God would send something better. A plan A that you would never need a plan B again. Jesus Christ, the great equalizer. You thought Denzel Washington was the equalizer, Bryce? No, no. I mean, in the movie, yes, but not in this movie. Jesus Christ, he is the great equalizer. And Jesus would come so radically on the scene in such a way that the way that he would love was so supernatural. The way that he would love was, would transcend race. It would transcend creed. It would transcend religion. It would transcend everything. And Jesus would start to teach disciples, not just teach, but model it. So much so that the church that he would die for, the church that we get to be a part of today, that we're supposed to be the same as that church, that church would say things like, like Paul would write to the church in Galatia. Listen to what he says. Paul saying, because he learned from Jesus and others, there's no longer a Jew or a Gentile. There's no longer. That's the, they're different races, you get it? A Jew is a different, anyway. There's, there's no longer this race or that race. There's no longer slave or free. This is Galatians 3.28. There's no longer male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. So, so Jesus not only would, would teach this, but he would model it in such a way that it was so radical. Like, like if this was where people were at, Jesus would hang out here because the great equalizer was trying to level this playing field and show them all the love of the Father. And that's why, he, that's why the people that were better than, the people that thought they were, I mean, they were prejudiced. They were racist. There was a lot of racism. It's not a new thing. It's been happening since sin entered the world. And these, these people that were racist, you know what they say to Jesus? Why would you eat with such scum? Why do you hang out with such losers? Why do you hang out with such these, this group of minorities, these, 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 these sinners, these degenerates? Why would you do that? Even the disciples would question when Jesus would hang out with a woman at the well. Oh my gosh, a woman? Considered much less than in this society for sure back then. So Jesus is talking to a woman and she's a half breed. She's a mixed race, half Gentile, half Jew. That made her way low. Plus she's got this reputation. Jesus, what? What are you doing? And Jesus says, this is what I came to do. I wonder if Jesus wanted to say to Peter and the others, I wish you could see her like I see her. Mm -hmm. Like when I look at that woman who's at the well getting water, I don't, I don't see this mixed race woman. I don't see this, this promiscuous woman. I don't see a, a, a gender. I see someone created in my image. Mm -hmm. I see someone that I came for and that I love and that I died for, or that I will die for in this case. That's who he sees. Oh God, would you give us eyes to see like you see. Father, that you would transcend anything happening in our hearts and our minds right now, that you would give us eyes like you see. My question is, what do you see? Like, you, I'll show you this picture. You see these babies. I think it's easy for anybody to look at this, th these beautiful little bundles of joy and it's easy to say, oh my gosh, they are created in God's image. They are, they are, they are beautiful and they are, they are loved by God and Jesus came for them and Jesus loves them and Jesus died for them. That's easy to say. But what about when the little babies grow up? And they, and they start to make decisions that maybe aren't decisions that we think are right or that we know aren't right. And we look at a picture of, say, Oh, Aaron Hernandez, okay? You look at a picture of him, what do you see? A football player? A great athlete? A mixed race? Half Puerto Rican, half Italian? You see a criminal? You see a murderer? You see a prisoner? Jesus, what do you see? And Jesus, I believe with all my heart, would say, I see someone created in my image, someone that I came for, someone that I died for. 
and someone that I love. We see George Floyd. What do you see? You see a man? You see a black man? You see this man with a large stature? Do you see a man who, who seems to have his whole life ahead of him? A man with a promising future? You see a man whose life was snuffed out through an incredible act of hate and injustice? Jesus, what do you see? I think Jesus would say, I see a man created in my image, a man who I love, a man who I came for, a man who I died for. But what about him? What about him, Jesus? Derek Chauvin, this, this, this police officer, what do you see? I'm asking you what you see. You see a white man? You see a cop? A crooked cop? Someone who swore to uphold a certain law and, and carry it out, but didn't? You see a racist. You see a murderer. See a prisoner. Jesus, give us your eyes. What do you see? I think Jesus would say, I see a man created in my image. I see a man that I came for and that I died for and that I love. Oh, that we would be given eyes to see. I know it's challenging. I know this is going to challenge us in many ways, but it needs to challenge us in many ways. We are seeing there's a reality. God is showing us there's a truth. What's his truth? We're, we're all, we all come from the same family. We're all created equal. We're all made in the image of God, human beings. How grateful we are. We should be to be a human being created in God's image. Beautiful in his eyes. Every one of us. That's the truth. So practicality. What are we going to do? What do we do? I think that, 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 might, that question might need to change. I'm changing it. It's not what we do. It's what I do. Mm. Remember, I can't breathe. It starts with who? Me. Me. If it doesn't start with me, it'll never flow to we. It never will. So I, 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 th 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 this is too big to even go to we right now. It's got to be me. What, what, God, what are you showing? It starts with me. Type that in comments. It starts with me. I'm acknowledging there is a problem because I can't change what I don't own. And this, I want to help you with this. I will give you a practical step, a, a scripture that we're going to make a graphics for. We're going to share with you on social media. I want you to own this scripture. I want you to reflect on this scripture. Step one for you and I to own this. If it starts with me, I need to examine my heart. I need to examine my heart. Examine your own heart. I have to examine in my heart. How do we do that? With scripture. Psalm 139, verse 23 and 24. This is a good one. It's easy to, it's easy to remember. It's just hard to own. Search me, oh God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. God, would you point out anything in me that offends you and, and lead me on the path to everlasting life? Oh boy point out anything in me that offends you, Father. We have to examine our own heart. We have to, what you have to ask yourself and what I have to ask myself, is there any place in my heart that I need to repent? Is there any place in my heart where I know that I've allowed the seeds, the roots, the corruption of racism and prejudice to seep into me unknowingly? Now, listen to me. If you quickly say, I'm good, that's not me. If you quickly can say, I, 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 don't, I don't have that. I don't have that ill will. I don't, I don't think that way. If you quickly say that, I, I want to push back. I would suggest you're moving too quickly. Okay? I would suggest you're moving too quickly. By the way, this was me. I wrote this down. The self-righteous are rarely self-aware. Mm -hmm. wow. The self-righteous are rarely self-aware. The last person that could see they were a Pharisee was a Pharisee. The last person that thinks they're a racist is probably someone who's got some racism in their heart. Mm -hmm. I'll get vulnerable with, you, vulnerable with you in this message. When I watched that video of George Floyd, I knew God was convicting me because I, I've never doubted racism is real. I've never doubted that it existed. I, I've, I've never thought, oh, we're good. We don't have racism in the world. Here's, here's where my problem was that God revealed that day I watched the video. I just figured it was more segregated to certain areas certain people or certain neighborhoods it's more prevalent but there's some areas where it's it's you know we we've we've got past that 
I don't know if that's the case anymore. I think I was negligent. I think I was uh, deceived by the evil one. I, I really do. I, I, thought we were far, I thought we were farther along than we are. I did. I did. I believe I was wrong. That's what God is doing in my heart right now. That's why this message is so real and so meaningful to me. I hope it is to you too. We have to examine our heart. Well, the second thing that we need to do, if it starts with me, we, it, it starts, in this next point, it really starts um, at a table with Jesus. Jesus, on, on the week that Jesus would go to the cross for you and I, he would do something so radical that it would, it would, it, the disciples wouldn't have a understand, they, they wouldn't get it. But he would have a meal with them. And after the meal, Jesus would uh, push back from the table and he, he would wrap a towel around his waist and he would, he would get on his knees with a posture of almost a servant or a slave. And he would start to wash the disciples' dirty feet. And they knew he was, they, at this point, they, 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 they were like, this guy, he's, he's something. We believe he's the son of God. We believe that he's the anointed one. And he's down there washing their feet. And Jesus is teaching them something in the moment, something new. Say new. Mm -hmm. This is new. This is going to be radical for a lot of you. I believe that with all my heart. It was for me. Jesus says something to them while he's washing their feet. Um, listen to this. In John 13, 34, he says, now I'm giving you a new commandment. Okay, a new commandment. And then he says, love each other. Wait a minute, Jesus, I have a question. That's not new. I mean, love one another? You taught that back when those guys asked what the greatest commandment was. You said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, that's the, and, that, and that's where it's new. I'm no longer saying just love your neighbor as yourself. I've upped the ante. Listen to, what, listen to the scripture. <laughs> Lean into this. This is good. I'm giving you a new commandment. Love each other just as I have loved you. So now they're not just called to love others like they love themselves, but Jesus is saying, now you've seen me love for three years. You've walked with me for three years. You've watched me teach for three years. You've watched me love for th three years. You've watched me commune and get down in the dirt with people who are dirty for three years. And now I am calling you to do the same. You aren't just to love like you love yourself, but now you are to love like I love you. And that is something new. That is something and that is what God is telling us. Will you see like I see? Will you love like I love? Jesus doesn't say, they'll know you're my disciples by the way that you love my God. Mm -mm. They'll know you're my disciples by the way that you love the Son. Mm -mm. They will know you're my disciples by the way that you love each other. Mm -hmm. One another. Type one another in comments. Boy, it's got to start with us. And Jesus has given them something. So, I mean, love like you love Jesus? And Jesus says, yes, you love exactly like I love because I've shown you the love of the Father and now I'm giving you the love of the Father and I'm going to insert the love of the Father in you so you have the capability to do it. So, so one of the seven core values of Meadows Church, well, the seventh one is Jesus. Seven is the number of perfection, by the way. And the seventh, you, th you might think, well, Jesus should be at the top. Now we put Jesus down here because he's the foundation of everything that we do at our church, or at least we try. And, and, and something that God showed me this week about Jesus being our, our, one of our core values, the, the foundational core value, is this. We need to be a people, that, I'm just speaking for, for Metal's Church right now, because you understand by now the church isn't like this, right? You get that, right? But the church is this and that and her and him. You under, okay, say people. people. People are the church. Meadows Church, we will be people who love Jesus. Mm -hmm. We will be people who love like Jesus. And we will be people, and this is a big one, we will be people who teach the next generation to love like Jesus loves. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll say it again. We will be people that will love Jesus. We have to love him. But we can't stop there. We will be people that love like Jesus. I'm giving you a new commandment and that is it. And then we will be people that will teach our children and their grandchildren and our grandchildren that they are to love like Jesus loves. This is what God is calling us to do. It has to go to the next generation. We have to feed truth and love into the next generation. We know that we've, we've been, we've been, we, I believe that we've gotten farther than we've gotten and we haven't. We have a long ways to go, but we can get there. We can do it. It starts with me and it starts with you, but it, but it has to flow to the next generation. Oh, the power of a child and the difference that they can make if we teach our kids. This quote from Nelson Mandela blows me away. No one is born hating. 
another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, well, they can be taught to love. Yeah. We need to teach others how to love. This is why this message had to go out. And this is why we have to speak to this. We, the church, the most powerful entity in the world, better speak to this. And we have to. I mean, there's something about kids. Oh, there's something about kids that get it. I mean, in fact, you know what? This video kind of sums that up. Check this out. Watch this. Precious two-year-old New Yorkers, Maxwell and Finnegan, racing for the giant hug. Acting like they hadn't seen each other for years, but it's actually only been two days. My friend, you are just adorable. It's the kind of image that pulls you in and glues you to the screen. When Maxwell's dad posted the video on Facebook, it went viral. These two just melt my heart. We need more of this unconditional love. To them, color doesn't matter. Friendship is all about the other stuff they share. Dancing riding scooters, and childhood. If we paid more attention to the wonder of children, just imagine what we could learn. A picture of what God, I think, wants it to look like. I see that I cannot help think of Matthew 18, 3. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Oh God, we need your truth. I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. Wow. Something about a child that gets it. Something about childlike faith. Isn't it? It blows me away. A couple weeks ago, my son Jake was playing uh, at the crick. We, I still don't know if it's Crick or Creek, but that's a whole nother conversation. But he was playing and he came home all muddy and I'm like, Jake, and he came home kind of mad. And I'm like, what's wrong? He's like, oh, we were playing football at the Creek. And uh, I'm like, that sounds kind of dangerous. But anyway, and he says, he got in an argument with one of the guys, one of his good friends. And so he's getting undressed and he's upset. And I said, you okay? He's like, yeah, yeah I'm fine. It wasn't an hour later he was putting his boots back on, jumping on his bike. I said, Jake, where are you going? Oh, I'm going over to so-and-so's house. I'm like, the same, the same so-and-so that you were so mad? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just, how do they do it? How can they forgive like that? How can they love like that? And then we get older and we become, we become tainted and twisted with sin and with history and with beliefs. And I mean, we will hold a grudge forever against somebody. A child? Come to heaven as a child. You, unless you, be, you become like a little child, we can't enter the kingdom of heaven. How do we enter the kingdom of heaven? Well, we are saved by God's grace through faith when we believe. We are saved by God's grace through faith when we believe in Jesus. But Jesus is saying that faith that you need, that belief, is this childlike faith. Faith that, that you, just, you just believe without seeing. You just trust because you're told that's the way it is. The beautiful way that God says it should be. Jesus is the answer to our deepest needs. Jesus is it. Equality, it's possible through Jesus. Justice flows through Jesus. Goodness comes from Jesus. Peace is available only through Jesus. And peace is available. Did you know that? Like, it's already come. I mean, I know you don't see it on the news. I know you're not seeing, seeing it in the riots and what's going on. We see that. We think peace will never be here this side of heaven. I'm telling you, it's already come and it's already available. I'll show you. Ephesians 2.14, Paul's writing to a church. He says, for Christ himself has brought peace to us. Ooh. He didn't say Christ is going to bring peace someday. Someday when you get to heaven, there will be peace and there will. But Paul says, Christ himself has brought peace to us. He's already brought it. He's already brought it. See, peace is available. That peace that passes all understanding, we don't have to wait for it. We can actually step into it. 
Let me finish the scripture. It says, listen to this. He, Jesus, united Jews and Gentiles, races. He united them. Oh my gosh, isn't that what we're preaching about? Jesus did it into one people when in his own body, in his own body on the cross, he broke down the wall of hostility that separated us. So Jesus Christ on the cross is what breaks the hostility in our world. It starts at the cross. Type that in comments. It starts at the cross. It starts with you and me, but we meet Jesus at the cross. I wrote it down this way. We will live in peace when Jesus lives in us. I'll say it again. We will live in peace when Jesus Christ lives in us. And by the way, the gospel of Jesus Christ, it isn't just for them people or those people. The gospel is for all people. That's what Jesus said. And that's what we will continually proclaim in the name of Jesus. That the gospel, which just means good news, the good news about Jesus is he didn't stay on the cross. That's incredibly good news. The cross is where we meet him, but that's not where he leaves us. Because the gospel says that three days later, Jesus Christ, check this out, would break forth from a tomb that they put him in. When they put him in there, he was dead. Guess what? When he came out, he was alive. And because he was alive, and because the greatest miracle in history happened, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, you and I have peace. We can. We have hope. We have love. We have life. We have abundance. We have purpose. We have Jesus. You can have him. This is what I'm asking. That, 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 that childlike faith that Jesus has as a requirement, I'm asking God that, give, that God gives you the faith right now to call on the name of Jesus. The, racism will never end without him. It never will. Until Jesus goes from out here to in here, to in here, until that happens, we will always have a problem. But when this happens, a miracle happens. The Holy Spirit enters into you. And the Bible says it doesn't just fix you up, but it makes you new. Now, you're still, you're still going to live in a world that's fallen, but you become, instead of being in the problem, you become part of the solution. You become Jesus to others. And pretty soon, you start living, acting, and loving in such radical ways that the world can't help but notice and be changed because of it. Will you choose that today? To become like a child. To have this childlike faith that says, Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. I believe that you died on a cross. I believe that you were dead in a tomb, but three days later, you broke forth from the tomb. I believe that, and I want to receive that because it starts with me. It starts with me. It starts with me. And if you want it to start with you, choose Jesus today. Like, I'm asking you for this to get better for you to live your purpose, for, for our world to be start to be healed in the name of Jesus, it starts with me, and it starts with you. Will you choose Jesus? Choose that he is the risen son of God, and that when you call on his name and ask him to forgive your sins, he does it, and he makes you new. He cleanses you from everything that you've done and everything that you said, and you can walk in a new way with his Holy Spirit inside of you, and he sees you differently. He doesn't see the sin, but he sees, he sees himself, you, him in you. Will you, will you type, I choose Jesus, in comments? Will you text, I choose Jesus, to 474747? It starts with you and it starts with me. Start there. Let's start there. But it won't stop there. Because when you do that, all of a sudden you become a citizen of heaven. And you don't have to wait for heaven to become a citizen of heaven. It happens when you choose Jesus. Oh, by the way, heaven, can I give you a picture of that? We're all, say all. All. Black, white, yellow, red, all are celebrated equally in heaven. That's right. I'm not just saying it, I'll show it to you. When John, the disciple, Jesus' good friend, is given a revelation, he wrote it down in Revelation 7, 9. This gives us a glimpse of what heaven truly looks like. Oh, it's a picture that you just need to put in your head. John writes, I looked. And there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, every tribe, 
people and language standing before the throne, standing before the Lamb. Can you picture that in your head? We are all equally celebrated in heaven. God, it is our prayer today that you would shrink the gap between heaven and earth, that you would literally pull down heaven. May your kingdom come today. May your will be done today on earth as it is in heaven. Somebody shout here. As in heaven. God, it's our prayer that today, in the name of Jesus, our earth will become more like heaven. Every tribe and every nation and every color and every creed coming together under the umbrella of love, under the umbrella of Jesus. God, the Spirit, your Spirit is so prevalent in every area. Listening to your word, go forth, God. I pray that you start to do a work in us. Let us take a message and not just hear it, Father, but let us take a message and do something with it because this is the time. Now is the, now is the time. And you have given us this time in history to make an impact that only we can make, Father. May we do it. And may, may we never stop celebrating and declaring that if we do what you tell us to do, if we do what your word says to do, well, if we do that, the best is truly yet to come here as in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Hey, thank you so much for watching today. I know almost every week and I encourage you to share the message with others because I know that when God's word goes forth, lives are changed. But I'm really asking for this message. If there's ever a message that has to go out, that we have to distribute to as many people as possible, this is it. Man, I'm asking if this message spoke to you at any level, that you would share it with friends, share it with family, share it with coworkers. Remember, who's it start with? It starts with me and it starts with you. And by us being bold enough to share it so others can hear this word from God and truth and get the reality and start to make the difference that God wants us to make. I'm so excited. Like I said, this, this conversation has to continue and it's going to continue uh, next week. So anyway, I love you so much and God loves you more. God bless you.